Welcome to Launchpad, the unique radio show and podcast that celebrates new book releases and the authors that created them. Now, let's take off with your host, Grace Salmon. This is Launchpad. Welcome to episode 42 with Brett Hurst, Anne Marie Farage Smith. Jude Berman, and Tracy Yokus. I am so excited, along with Mary Helen Sheriff, the author marketing coach, to be the host of Launchpad. Today we host Black Rose Writing Authors and She Writes Press Authors. We will be talking about the importance of family, trauma, and ways to recovery, the importance of pets in our lives, and how to cope with them when we lose them. We'll also do a romp through some crimes and suspense and spies, as well as some Silicon Valley gaming with some mind control twists. I'm so excited to welcome Jude Berman, Brett Hurst, and Tracy Yokus to the screen. Unfortunately, Anne-Marie Farage Smith was unable to join us today, but we'll be talking about her book as well, which is Healing Wisdom for Pet Loss. Let's jump right in. Jude Berman, tell us about your novel, The Die. Sure. And first, here is the book, which just came out a few weeks ago. And I have boiled down its description to two words, which are saving democracy. It's a book about saving democracy. And I started writing it in November of 2016 after that election. And I had worked really hard, put in a, hours over months of time working on that election and wasn't happy with the result. But not only was I not happy with the result, I looked around at the people I knew and many of them shared my feeling, but the difference that I saw was that they hadn't put time into much and it was almost as if they it wasn't a priority to them that they, you know, some of them, it almost seemed like, oh, well, didn't, you know, that they didn't care. And that motivated me to want to write about that and to see if I could move the needle in some kind of way. But I wanted to do it as fiction because, you know, if, if people aren't paying attention, fiction is a way to grab you, right? You know, it's it, it brings in the entertainment and the fun aspect of things. So, so, and I had been writing fiction anyway, even if it wasn't published yet. So I did that and I brought in wisdom from traditional sources, in particular, although people may not know it, the Bhagavad Gita. But I did it in a way, I wanted to do it in a way that you didn't have to know what that was to read the story and to enjoy the story and to also hopefully get the message of the story. Wonderful. Lots to talk about there, indeed. Anne-Marie Farage Smith, who was unable to join us today, has wrote a most unusual, to me anyway, self-help book. It's called Healing Wisdom of Pet Loss, An Animal Lover's Guide. And uh, I hope that you check out her work. It's a self-help book, as I mentioned, but it's also got a workbook with really interesting skills that you can actually master to deal with family loss of a pet. Let's move now to Brett Hurst, who has written The Caveman Conspiracy. He's with Black Rose Writing. Brett, tell us about your novel. Yeah, my novel, Who Comes Out Today? How weird is that? It's crazy. Congratulations. Uh, it is, yeah, thank you so much. It's been a long journey. Uh, it's a story about a ragtag group that uh, had a bad experience in the CIA and are trying to leave that behind them. Uh, and leave that whole life behind them. But when uh, a girl from the past shows up with his old boss uh, with, with concerns about a, uh, some meetings that a, a senator has taken, he's dragged back into this life uh, very much against his will. But, you know, girls get us to do things we don't want to do all the time. So, and he's pulled into, and as they're pulled into this, uh, which seems small, it gets a little bit larger and they don't know who to trust and how to trust them and where, and it gets bigger and bigger until they're pulled into a conspiracy bigger than they could possibly have imagined. Very fascinating. Sounds like you and Jude could have some common ground with conspiracy <laughs> there. 
Tracy, a very different kind of book with you. Bloodlines, a memoir of harm and healing. A, a, a very honest book. Tell us about it. Well, thank you, Grace. Yeah, I'm just so happy to be here today. This is my book, Bloodlines, um, more than 10 years in the making. So I'm super excited to say that finally, um, next Tuesday is my actual pub day. Um, so back in about 2012, my mother died unexpectedly. And unbeknownst to us at the time, this was going to end up being a trigger for uh, some serious mental health issues with my daughter. She was 13 at the time and um, woke up one day and just said she wasn't very hungry. And then soon after that, she was not really eating anything at all. And then she dove into a severe depression. So I already had a master's degree in counseling psychology at the time, which both made me then filled with shame that I somehow wasn't able to see this coming in my daughter's life and do something to prevent it or to be able to help her. Um, but also it didn't prepare me at all for being a family member and a mother of a child who was struggling with her mental health. So I am very passionate now, 12 years later, um, she's in recovery. She's doing awesome. She's launched. She's living her best life. And I am trying to create community where particularly moms, but family members who have a loved one struggling with their mental health can feel safe talking about it. And actually for all of us to talk about it because we all have mental health. <laughs> May is Mental Health Awareness Month. So I'm super excited to have this conversation today in particular because this is a great month. If you don't know where to start, start anywhere. And I'm going to be doing a lot of events this month in support of Mental Health Awareness Month and hoping that people will talk about it in their own lives in all the ways that are right for them and using the book, hopefully, as a springboard. Nice. Thank you for that. I, I'm so fascinated. We have very different books here today, but you each uh, already mentioned your publishing journey. We've got Jude, whose uh, book has been out a very short time, Brett, whose um, book comes out today, and Tracy next week. Let's each talk about your path to publishing, because I know our listeners, you know, everybody thinks they have a book in them. Sometimes we do. So, uh, Jude, let's start with you about your path to publishing with She Writes Press. Well, I'm assuming you mean how did I choose to work with a hybrid publisher? And well, just that entire process, how you chose to finally write this book. I know it was the the catalyst was the election. We've got another election coming up right now. So this is very timely now for the launch of your book as well. So I would just like to hear about your path to publishing your book. Yeah, so I had considered, you know, traditional publishing and I've actually run a couple of small presses, so I knew I did not want to do small presses, you know, since I, I was aware of just the amount of work that is involved in getting your book distributed or promoted with a small press. And I've also found that traditional publishers are not open <laughs> to people in my age range in particular and, you know, um, without huge social media platform and so i had heard about the uh, she writes press and and i was really um drawn to the model and um and i've been more than happy with it in fact i actually have two other books coming out with she writes press one later this year and one next year very prolific amazing congratulations tracy same question your publishing journey you talked about how many years this was in the making why was this the right time and why was your press the right press for you well uh that's a loaded question for my journey but the book was supposed to come out originally two years ago i had been working with linda joy myers um, who works with brooke warner um, they do a lot of classes together and she was actually the one who had suggested to me as we were going along the process she had asked me, do you feel like you have the wherewithal and the desire to do all the work required to try to find a traditional publisher? And I know some folks are very, you know, invested in that. And that's obviously totally fine. But for me, it had taken so long to get the book written. And then even it wasn't still written at that point that I felt like I don't have a hundred query letters or more in me. I don't have jumping through all these hoops that just 
that wasn't where my investment was in writing my story and sharing it. So I, when she suggested she writes, I didn't hesitate. I thought it was a great idea. And also I'm very thrilled with the process. They're so supportive there. You get such a professional product and get so much support. And um, when I pulled the book back, I mean, I think some people have had this experience, maybe not everyone, but I was devastated. I wasn't sure that I would, you know, be able two years ago to start all over again and finish. And I felt so bad that I had to pull it. And Brooke was nothing but supportive. I mean, I'm, you know, writing about some very intimate details of my family life. And she just wanted to make sure that the book was exactly the way I wanted it and that I had my family support the way that I needed it to be able to get it into the world. And so I had all of that and more. So I was very, uh, very satisfied and still am and grateful that this is how my publishing journey has gone. Oh, wonderful. Brooke, Brooke is an amazing human being and a great support <laughs> to authors. Brett, you're with a small press and I know many authors from Black Rose Writing. Let's talk about your journey to um, landing with them. Yeah, okay. So I always, always wanted to write, always write, always wrote and did things. And I uh, got a book that I felt okay with. I started going to writers conferences and querying and I wasn't really getting anywhere to go. And it, I went to a writers conference in Athens, Georgia and uh, one of the breakout sessions was this uh, short woman with a deep Texas twang, and she gave a long lecture called The Rules of Your Book. And I went, holy cow, I don't know what I'm doing. And so I wrote feverishly. I wrote, 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 wrote uh, everything she said, and I went, and I, I started over, and I wrote a whole different book, and I wrote it, and I took me a couple of years to do it, and it turned out I had her business card somewhere, and I hired her, and I sent it to her, and I said, okay, I think it. And she said, okay. And uh, I think Brett has frozen on us for a moment. Um, so you got her business card and you said to her, let's see if you unfreeze for us. Are we back? You, you are back. Uh, you froze for just a moment. You were telling us that um, you rewrote your book and yep, then you and had the said, business card and what happened next? And she said, it's, I like this book a lot. She said, but you tell me it's a suspense novel. It's not very suspenseful. So we talked and we went back and forth and I learned a ton more from her. And then I looked and I said, well, can I do this? But the sequel to this book maybe maybe lends itself more to that. So I took everything she did and then I wrote another book and I sent that book to her and she said, yeah, this is the one. And so uh, so then I said, OK, I have this and the other one I would keep someday as a prequel where I'd be so fortunate for such a thing. Right. And so. Then I started querying and doing all the things that you normally do. I started going to uh, writers' conferences. I live in Atlanta. I belong to the, right, the Atlanta Writers Group, and I went to their conference, and I told the gentleman I know that runs it, I was like, everybody here is looking for Oprah's Book Club or some different things like that. I'm, I'm having real trouble finding people that, that are, will do, like spy, that kind of novels. He goes, it's a very, very tough thing to break into. It's a very, very closed group. He goes, you might want to think about some smaller publishers, and I have some smaller publishers on the docket on one of ours coming up, so keep that in mind, which I really appreciated. And then we had another conference the year after I saw that Black Rose Writing was in there. I gave them my packet. Uh, he asked to see me. We had a very, very good conversation. Uh, he actually, uh, at that, he gave me an award for my pitch at that pit, and I sent it all to him. And about three weeks later, I was on my way. And today is launch day, as you yeah, mentioned, launch day. Yeah. for the caveman conspiracy. Let's talk a bit about genre. Um, and Tracy, I'm going to start with you. I think people might have been very tempted to fictionalize your story as opposed to going with memoir. So let's talk about memoir versus fictionalizing, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. That suggestion was made to me um, many times <laughs> as I was on my writing journey. And I, I mean, of course, there's something to be said for fictionalizing this because I wouldn't have had to adhere so uh, strictly to my truth of what happened. And it wouldn't feel so exposing, obviously, to me and my family. But um, having been on this journey now for over a decade, I am very passionate about destigmatizing conversations around mental health. 
That certainly can happen with fiction. I'm not saying that it doesn't, but I feel like putting out the true circumstances um, that my family and I went through that tens, if not hundreds of thousands of families are going through across the country right now. The stats bear this out. Our children's mental health is headed scarily in the wrong direction. That um, some of us who have this lived experience, um, not and not everyone can, I totally understand that, but those of us who can and who have the support it's really powerful for people who are going through now what we went through then to know that they're not alone. And secondarily, the sort of second storyline um, in my book is my own scenes from my own childhood where I experienced uh, patterns or circumstances that maybe don't tick traditional boxes of what people would consider traumatic, um, but that were in fact traumatizing and how that informed the adult that I became and also uh, the wife, friend, and mother that I became and how a very large part of my journey because ultimately we can't actually control uh, the trajectory of other people's illnesses was the need for me to do my own work um, and waking up to what that meant exactly and how I could best support my daughter. So it was very important to me to keep this story a memoir and truthful. I will say, however, that if my family particularly my daughter had come to me because of course she has read this book and signed off on what I shared. And we had many, many, many conversations about what was okay to share and what wasn't okay to share and where that line was, which I respected every step of the way. But if she had read this final version and um, said, no, please don't, I wouldn't have. So um, I'm just lucky that we are, well, I'm not lucky. We worked really hard to get here, but I'm very lucky that my family in their own ways is as passionate as I am about destigmatizing these types of conversations. Thank you. And you mentioned something, you know, about it being scary. And I think when I write, I, I have seven books and, you know, it's still the most naked thing I do. It is the most vulnerable thing I do. Jude, I'd like you to talk a little bit about that, of just being so vul vulnerable. You've chosen to write um, The Die, a novel. And uh, how did that feel to be so out there in front of friends, family and your readers? Um, I would say I didn't feel that way. <laughs> I, okay. I don't, I don't, I mean, I've been in publishing in so many ways for so many years that I, I guess I'm not looking at it at that way in particular. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that in, in my perspective, you know, we have a voice and it's something to use. And so I sort of have the perspective that if I'm willing to do that, I can sort of step aside and, and rather than, you know, feeling vulnerable, it's just, it's something that I can do because I have the ability to do it. Oh, I love that. And the I willingness mean, to, ah, the willingness I love to do that. it. Yeah. I can say if you, I don't know, this is maybe going back to your other question and maybe you don't want that, but I, I interestingly just wrote a piece in writer's um, digest about genre. So, um, that I wouldn't say that's vulnerability, but um, it certainly is something that's been an issue for for my book. And um, the title of that is "Genre as a Crusher of Creativity." So, so I wouldn't again, I wouldn't call that vulnerability, but that's been my experience that it can certainly um, complicate matters in getting a book out there. I think I want to hear more about that in a minute, but I don't want to leave Brett out of the conversation. Brett, vulnerable when you launch today? Yeah, no, I'll tell you, I'm having a launch party next week. I was much more vulnerable about sitting at an empty desk with knowing showing up to that than I was about putting the book out here. Uh, I wrote the book that I wanted to read, and now we'll see whether or not anybody else agrees with that. In, in, the, in this genre, and, and Please don't misunderstand me. There's some very good books in this genre, but there are some guy who is a Superman stops some terrorist from attacking pick the White House, you know, Air Force One, some massively big thing. And and I, they're they're all the same to to me. They were all the same. They were they other people trying to copy was good. So I I like them more escapist than that. I, I like them more Ludlum esque, even though he did some of that as well. Um, and so 
so I wrote the book that I was always hoping I could find and read and I never found, right? And so, um, it's, so hopefully, I, when I look at the comments of these kind of books, I see, oh, yep, that's my reader, that's my reader. And so I'm hoping that I find that place and it's a little bit different. So, so from that perspective, I didn't really fill out there. I, I wrote the book that I had been looking for and I couldn't find. That's wonderful. Let's go back to Jude for a minute. You were talking about genre as crushing creativity. That sounds like something we could all be interested in. Um, yeah, look up the article too. It, um, I could put a link somewhere. But um, yeah, the idea is that because there's so many books written, you know, genres have developed in recent decades and, and books get pigeonholed into them. And it's very difficult if you write a book such as mine, um, you know, that doesn't fit into one, or even that is mistakenly characterized as one, like somebody put my book as a crime thriller or something or sci fi, and it's not. And so what I found is that then people get annoyed when they go read your book, and they were looking for this thing in this box that it doesn't fit in that box and then the, you know they're annoyed and so the crusher of creativity is that authors anticipate that and so they write to a genre and i hear authors talk about that a lot trying to you know i'm going to write a da 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 you know genre not just genre but subgenre and sub sub subgenre um and i i just feel that if i had done that i would not have been able to write the book that i wrote and wanted to write very interesting. Uh, can I make a quick comment, Grace? Please do. I had a early in my writing career, I was doing something or my writing path. I had an agent tell me that if the box boy in the back of Barnes and Noble doesn't know what shelf to put your book on, it'll never make it to the floor. Which I think is what she's saying, you know what I'm saying? Both the good and bad, you know, the, the retail industrialization of publishing, you know, but it was an interesting comment and that comment stuck with me, right? So I was writing maybe less genreless before, but after that, especially somebody trying to become a first time published author, right? I, I did migrate more towards specifically genre work, but it was interesting that that's a comment that an agent told me years and years ago. Well, and I think the genre, you know, we have, a lot of bending around different genres now and blending different genres. But I do think that is an important comment. I'd like to get a little bit deeper into each of your books. Tracy, tell us more about your book. Um, what What's inside? Okay, well, um, what's inside? So I took, it spans in the traditional timeline about a year and a half, starting at my mother's death briefly, and then following our trajectory as my daughter started experiencing her symptoms and the treatments that we went through, um, the frankly failures of the system as it still exists today that existed then 12 years ago, um, in part also ways that the system did support us appropriately and just all of the hoops that we had to go through to try to find uh, treatment and to do the right things to support her the way, the best way that we could as her parents. And then, as I said, so those um, are scenes in the now timeline. And then I interject scenes in certain places from my childhood to juxtapose, I hope, how uh, suboptimal patterns that we learn, um, relational patterns that we learn, basically, and also intergenerational trauma, which starts forming in us while we're not even born yet. Um, and, you know, learning and understanding that we have before we have the cognitive ability to understand follows us um, into our adulthood and into our adult relationships. And as we, especially women, are having our children, unless we are, and sometimes even if we are aware of certain patterns that don't necessarily serve us or our children, that can sometimes not be enough to break those patterns and replace them with healthier ones. So <clears throat> that's what those childhood scenes are meant to do, illuminate issues from my childhood, um, you know, throwing terminology around like codependence, uh, people pleasing, things like that. But I try not to use that vernacular. I just try to show scenes um, and tell story that will, I hope, stick with people about the hard work that it's required to break those patterns. And the, the story, this book really ends 
long before where we are now. So maybe there'll be a book too that d dives more into exactly all the healing work that went into it. Um, but certainly those two timelines and that time period are meant to show not only people, like I said, who are going through what we did, that they're not alone, but also, again, the path to healing, really the only one we can control is our own. So that's what I hope people will really take away if they see themselves, because for years, I only learned some of this. The first time I got into therapy, I was 30. So that was 25 years ago. My final insight, which is not my final insight ever, but the puzzle piece that needed to fall into place for me to finish the book the way it was just happened last year. So, you know, we can, we can know things to a certain extent, but it's the overused metaphor of the onion, you know, insight is, can be a one and done, but usually it's the one that just leads to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. It's a journey for sure. Jude, what's inside? Tell us a little bit more. Yeah. So what's inside in terms of the actual story is we are in the near future. We're in Silicon Valley in California and a dictatorship has taken over most of the states, except for California and a couple of states that have kind of joined together and are an independent democratic nation. And so the characters are young, um, young working professionals in a gaming company. And um, life is good in California for the most part. Um, until they start to see some things going wrong that are threats um, to them personally, but also to their country. And so we see them, you know, um, without giving any spoilers, uh, you know, trying to fix that. Wonderful. Brett, what's inside? So as our protagonist, as I said at the beginning, didn't want to be pulled back into this situation or this world, as they're pulled in and the more, uh, the main character's name's Eddie, the more Eddie learns, the more he information he gathers, the less he understands who he can trust in the situation, be it the, the woman who tried to convince him back in, his old boss, the senator that he interacts with. And so the more things we discover, the less clear it is for him, the less secure he thinks. And then at one point, you notice in the front of it, there's a boat. At one point, um, he agrees to take this trip uh, on this yacht to this place to find out. And now he's stuck at sea with people that he doesn't trust, that he doesn't know, where he's very, very vulnerable. And his support team, he's not one of these supermen, the support team he has is separated from him. And there's distance between him and how he gets in the, the more we learn, the harder it is him to figure out where he is and what direction and who's an ally and who's an enemy, uh, the deeper the book goes. All of your books sound so amazing. Again, I'm sorry that Anne-Marie Farage Smith could not join us. Her book is called Healing Wisdom for Pet Loss, An Animal Lover's Guide uh, with Real Teachable Skills to Deal with and Prepare for the Loss of a Family Pet. I'm so glad to have met each of you. Jude um, Berman with her novel, The Die. Tracy Yokas with her memoir, Bloodlines, a memoir of harm and healing, and Brett Hurst with The Caveman Conspiracy. Thanks so much for being with us here at the Launchpad. Thank you so much. This episode is copyrighted by Grace Salmon and Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. Thank you for visiting with us on Launchpad. <laughs>